Over the last 20 years, Britain's coal mining industry has undergone successive and continuing modernization. At some of our mines, the new look has been apparent from the surface, even to the casual passerby. At others, the updating is not so obvious to those outside the mining community. New equipment and new techniques have been installed deep underground, where the most important work is done. But there's nothing new in all this. Many of our mines have already been reorganized and re-equipped again and again since they first came into production towards the end of the last century. What in those days was the relatively new art of photography allows us today to get an idea of what it was like to be a miner at the turn of the century. Photographic records chart the progress of many of our coal fields. The coal board has its own photographic archive and now a national mining museum is to be established to record the history and development of coal mining. Cutting the first sod at the site of a new mine was always a ceremonial occasion, whether in the Welsh rain or in Midland sunshine. But before the ground could be opened, a great deal of work had to be done by geologists and surveyors. Today's techniques are still very much the same. Test borings were made. The carefully boxed core samples give a detailed picture of the layers of rock and minerals far beneath the surface. Behind the scenes, checks were signed and work could start in earnest. The first job was to get down to the coal measures. Shaft sinking meant digging straight down for 1,500 feet or more. At the bottom of the shaft, a complex of tunnels and roadways was driven to provide for ventilation, for the transport of men and materials, and for getting coal to the surface. On top of the mine, the familiar head stops went up. A coal mine is a complicated affair. It needs workshops to repair and fabricate equipment. It needs machinery for cleaning and grading the coal. There must be a lamp room to store and maintain the lights men will use underground. There had to be stables for horses, who were still an important part of the workforce. And while construction was going on, the building workers and their families had to be provided with temporary accommodation. Steam was the driving force, and boilers were installed to supply power to the engine rooms to drive air compressors, ventilation fans, drainage pumps, and, of course, to wind the cages up and down the shaft. In those days, the most common method of coal winning meant first undercutting the coal seam with pits. Then miners bored into the coal, often using hand drills. Finally, the temporary supports were removed and the coal brought down by a series of explosive charges. Coal then had to be loaded by hand into small wagons, tubs, and hauled by pit ponies to the bottom of the shaft. Even at the turn of the century, major mining disasters were mercifully rare. But the bigger collieries were well prepared for emergencies, by the standards of the times. The formation of units of the St. John's Ambulance Brigade meant that there was usually a trained first aider nearby when he was needed. Payday at the mine. Afterwards, the share-out. For groups of men were often employed as a team and paid by results. Often the day was enlivened by a meeting, perhaps a hymn and a sermon from a revivalist preacher. Sometimes the meeting had a more serious purpose. The increasingly powerful trade unions were determined to improve the lot of their members. Often the inflexible attitude of the mine owners meant that disputes were frequent and bitter. There were no pithead bards, so the day's grime had to be washed off back at home. Families were large and the mining community close-knit. 
it was quite usual for three generations of one family to be working at the same mine. Community service was taken seriously. Grandfather as parish clerk and as miner. During the summer, on rest days, cricket was always a popular game. A number of miners became professional. This colliery, Shirebrook, on the Nottinghamshire Derbyshire border, was sunk in 1896. The men who came to work here were lucky to be able to move into a well-laid-out village within walking distance of the mine. There were no heavy lorries in those days, so a temporary siding from the main railway line brought building materials down the main street of the village. They had a school, a terrace of shops, a house for the manager, a chapel, and, of course, a pub. The original Sharbrook village is still recognisable. The shops are still there. The pub still stands on the corner. Cars and trucks throng the road where the railway siding once ran. The weekly market still brings crowds to the village square. Within a few years of production starting at Sharbrook, they were winning half a million tonnes of coal a year. Today, Sharbrook is more than a million tonner. In 1973, Lady Ezra, the wife of the chairman of the coal board, visited the colliery to inaugurate production from a coal seam previously unworked. Her visit coincided with an open day at the mine to give the families of mine workers and the people of the locality a chance to see on the surface many of the big machines that work underground. Today, Shirebrook is still one of the largest and most productive of the 12 collieries in its area. Underground, six fully mechanized coal faces win the coal. Coal is cut and loaded by machine. On all faces, the strata are controlled by hydraulic-powered roof supports. Plans are already in hand for the installation of even newer equipment, which will allow production to rise yet again to nearly one and a half million tonnes a year. And in the village itself, new buildings are going up to replace the old and to make available more accommodation. Today's generation of children attend a modernized village school. Many of them will continue to follow in the footsteps of their parents and grandparents. But they will be coming into an industry revolutionized and changed beyond recognition over the 80 years of this colliery's history.